I've had the opportunity to study with you for a few months now, and we've looked at the, the, the author of John and his lens of, of how he kind of extrapolates the life of Jesus, his character, how he lived his life. And so uh, we want, there's, there's so many things that we could talk about, but I think context is really important, Ziggy. So perhaps just for people here, you know, you, I, I remember watching an interview about you where you said growing up, it was inconceivable that you would ever believe in Jesus. Why? What's wrong with Jesus? There's nothing wrong with Jesus, on the contrary, but um, just the culture we were brought up in yes. had nothing to do with Christians. We, everything in our life was Jewish. Even right. the cucumbers we ate were Jewish cucumbers. Um, and therefore, it's, is it Jewish or is it not? And, you know, and that the kind of big question is, is, is it, but is it good for the Jews? Right. It, it's, always, it's just a very uh, a protective identity. And those on the outside, um, we have to be wary of. And that's the kind of culture I grew up in. I think, I think we, we talk of anti-Semitism today, mm. uh, whether that be some kind of you know, physical or verbal abuse or a swastika on a, on a tree, uh, we get that where I live. Um, but in the 1940s and 50s, anti-Semitism was a reality of every kind of English life. It's the kind of life that my parents would have grown up with. They would have grown up with knowing that they were sufficiently different and needed to be um, on their guard. And so we talk about how whatever anti-Semitism is today, it's, it's slightly shifted from what it was. Right. In the past, where you, in terms of Jewish people are very free to get all kinds of jobs today. Mm. But I think about 50, 50 years ago, I think it was a different story. I sure. Think, yeah, so I. But OK, that, that obviously you, you jump straight in, in there and obviously anti-Semitism is a, is a ruthless reality. How is that linked to Christianity in basic terms for people that might not know? I suppose in its simplest form. It's you, uh, you read the Gospels and you're looking at a Jewish story uh, of Jewish people interacting with a Jewish man, Jesus, claiming to be their Messiah. But there's great division over him. And some people are worshipping Jesus and other people are planning to, to murder him. And ultimately they do. But the way that that was manifest within, within the church, within a predominantly Gentile setting, is to kind of demonise uh, Judas or to demonise the Jewish people. And of course, any kind of demon, because we've all got friends, don't you? And if, you, if you're the kind of person who lives in a community that gossips, you, you know what it, how quickly you start demonizing people. There's that one person in the office who is the one who's causing all of the, the problems. But the reality for Jewish people, they became demonized. If a child went missing in a small village um, 500 years ago yeah. or a thousand years ago, well, they, would, uh, they wouldn't assume that, you know, the uncle was the paedophile who'd done who'd done this terrible thing they would think it was the jewish people who lived down the road right i mean right and, and so the jewish people became the scape have become yeah. the scapegoat and even within the concentration camp setting um nazi guards are saying to jewish people you killed jesus mm -hmm. which is really confusing for jewish people because they because there's one woman that said I never met Jesus, and yet I'm being accused of killing him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's just a, a frightening reality, isn't it? Really. I, mean, I suppose I've had a, I've had a little bit of that uh, in a very small sense. That my my grandmother, as we we've, we've discussed before, um, had Jewish parentage, although her herself was not sure. She didn't she wasn't a practicing Jew, and living in London, she basically in the 1920s didn't tell people she was Jewish. In fact, it was it was just avoided completely. And it's quite sad, and I and I tried to understand that reality then. It must have been terrible to live 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 then. But it's not just then. It's even they're saying it's on the rise now. Why do you think that is? I, mean, I don't think I can conceive your question fully. But in your uh, grandmother, she wasn't brought up with any sense of a, of Jewish identity, no. and in many ways, I think of her parents are trying to protect her mm. from any form of discrimination. Mm. which I think is an interesting uh, thing isn't it children always want the best for their children and if, if they know if you're a new immigrant that's had to leave your country because of violent vile persecution yeah. you might just think well we don't believe in God anyway 
And the best thing we would do is simply just not to pass this thing on and let our daughter have a fruitful English life. Yeah, sure. So can a Jew be a Christian or can a Jew believe in Jesus? Can a Jewish person uh, believe in Jesus? Well, we, we do hope so. And I think the when you just read the, the eyewitness accounts of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus in any one of the gospel accounts, mm. you're looking up plenty of Jewish people setting a healthy precedent that being Jewish and believing in Jesus yeah. is actually <clears throat> uh, 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 the ultimate aim of Jesus's ministry. He's looking mm. for faith in him. And we may think of the famous Jewish people, most famous Jewish people who believe in him would be his disciples. Yeah. Would be Peter, James and John, or maybe you're thinking Mary and Martha, probably yeah. uh, some of the most famous Jewish women who ever lived, or his mother even, Mary. Yeah, yeah. Mary. So we, I think so the New Testament is full of many Jewish people believing in Jesus against a backdrop of, of a minority of, of Jewish leadership who feel deeply threatened mm-hmm. by him. Could you perhaps share with us how you became um, to believe in Jesus? This is a long story, but uh, I'll keep okay. it in, in its in its shortest form. Uh, a very good friend of mine, uh, who uh, who wasn't Jewish or Christian, when we at university, when I was doing my PhD, he, we were very very good friends, and uh, he he's someone who's just like me. He was just an, an agnostic. Um, if God existed, we didn't know. It's not that we had proof either way. Um, we were open to something, but we weren't ever taking, we weren't searching for anything. But in his life, he had an opportunity to hear the gospel. I mean, he'd been brought up in a, in a Christian home, kind of somewhat liberal Christian home, but he heard that he came to hear the gospel for the very first time as an adult. And he really understood who Jesus is. Again, he looked at the eyewitness accounts, he'd read them. He'd had, uh, he'd come to a clear picture of Jesus. And then he invited, started inviting his friends. And I went to a, a guest event at his church and, um, and because of the sheer quality of that friendship, and we're even uh, tremendously good friends today, all those years on, um, I didn't look, uh, I didn't see a church, I wasn't entering a church building, even though it was, I was just going to an event that my friend, my good friend, relationally, who I trusted and loved, uh, was bringing me to hear something that, that had impacted his life. And, and clearly it had taken, a, it was a, a brave step for him to be this vocal about what he believed, given that all of his friends were mocking him for being a fool. And then there's his poor Jewish friend, myself, and he's thinking, I mean, how much abuse can, can he actually take? But I came along. Yes. I did a short course called Christianity Explored. And really I'm, I'm reading the, the, the eyewitness accounts of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus for the very first time in my life. And I'm asking myself the simple question, is Jesus our Messiah? Is he the one we were taught about in the synagogue as children? And I suppose on a a journey where I did some reading, began to look at prophecies in the Hebrew Bible, pointing towards the coming of Messiah, I came to realize ultimately in in the fullest sense that I understood that we needed a Messiah to come and deal with our sin, to restore me to the Father. Mm. And that for me wasn't just knowledge. There was a point at which when that knowledge was transformed into a heart transformation within me, when I actually knew that I was, um, I deeply sinned against God, I was rebellious against God, my attitude was completely incorrect. Mm. Uh, and yet God wanted to forgive me. It was an overwhelming uh, love. Um, Can I just ask, uh, uh, this is really interesting, but prior to having this sort of heartfelt realization as you put it that that jesus is the messiah did you know uh, intimately the lens of of what the of what the jews believed about the good book yes if um it's interesting to to decompose your question slightly um we were practicing jews but primarily traditional so we we did major festivals but not minor festivals um as my mum would have said but we're not we're not extreme about the belief that we have um, deep pride in being Jewish. But in terms of that lens, uh, uh, um, the lens that maybe an Orthodox Jewish friend might have, which is very Israel centric, which I think has very deep anti-Christian missionary kind of sentiment, trying to keep people away from the possibility that Jesus could ever be telling us the truth, maybe with a, a slightly, with a, re, with a reconstructed um, right. um, understanding of what the Messiah would bring, what he would do. Um, it seems to be very much reacting against the reality that um, 
human beings are, uh, for the beginning of the Bible story, were, were in a relationship with God that was ruined. And very clearly, even though you don't see the word sin in Genesis 3, in the, in the story of Adam and Eve being deceived and betraying God, but that is what that that is what sin is, and they've walked away from God. So I, I think ultimately, you're looking for a solution to the problem of mankind that is about restoring us into relationship with God, dealing with our fundamental nature. Mm. Um, whereas Judaism has a, has a slightly different perception of that. They feel that they can overcome their particular sin. Mm. Um, that actually we don't we don't have to be defeated by sin. Sin doesn't have to be an inevitability. Um, but the reality is the Bible says that everyone who sins dies. Mm. So I think I so I think actually as much as that lens is trying to to dumb down sin, maybe to suppress the significance and the seriousness of sin, I think the consequences of sin are still manifest, um, which is why I think we come to Jesus because it's just a better fit. It fits to, um, the, the biblical data better than than I feel a rabbinic interpretation of the Bible does. It's just better. I think it's a language of Hebrews that Jesus is better than Moses. There are lots of things that Jesus is just better at. It's not a contrast saying choose one or the other, but rather think which one is the better fit to the biblical storyline that God uh, loves us and ultimately wants to restore us back into relationship with him. Right. How did your parents feel about you giving your life <laughs> to Jesus? How did that go down? Well, I mean, I had my own particular way of navigating to, to communicate to, to them. I knew it would be very devastating to my mother. And um, and she's probably become, she's not, none of my family is open to this, but they are, they love me and my wife and, and, her, and her grandson. And I think they're, they're still deeply ashamed. They still don't want their family and friends to know. Mm. They feel um, deeply troubled by it. Right. Um, but I think that they're, they're not neutral at all, um, but it's, they're not asking the right questions. They're not searching themselves. Mm. They mm. could come and say, look, you know, just tell us, what is it you, you believe? They're, they're, they're not at that, at that particular point. Yeah. But how did you feel? I mean, you, you obviously, you transitioned into becoming a Christian. I mean, how did you feel internally? Did you feel shame? Were you frightened? I mean, it was the right question. Uh, for, for me, it was um, internal struggles because I think I was, I've clearly was being pulled towards Jesus in my restructuring and in my belief and what made sense. Um, but I was very unhappy with the idea of becoming a Christian. Not that I would use the word Christian for myself, becoming a, a Jewish person who believes in Jesus wasn't something that sat very well with me. And I think in, my, in the early months of being a believer, I would have said I just feel very uncomfortable with with the language of calling myself a, a believer or even a Christian or believer um, until eventually I just I just began to to understand that it's now an issue of belonging to Jesus identifying with him and that comes with with labels it was definitely um, without being unsympathetic to, uh, to a particular word feeling schizophrenic as it were yeah. of, of thinking I want to be loyal to my Jewish identity but I also want to be loyal to Jesus how do I do both and I think actually it's just coming to understand the Jewishness of the New Testament, mm. the Jewishness of the way that God has revealed himself throughout human history, just I think ultimately in meeting other Jewish believers in Jesus helped me understand actually that um, my settled identity is as a Jewish believer mm. in Jesus and there's, there, isn't, there is no tension. Yeah. So much of the debate between Judaism and Christianity involves interpretation of passages of the Bible. And as you know, that's kind of how we met because there were just these kind of seemingly smoking guns from the sort of rabbinic tradition traditional answers to certain things like the virgin birth that honestly if you you know look as a christian i felt it was very important for me to understand at least the lens of a jewish person because what we call the word of god or a, a great deal <clears throat> in the old testament is jewish and there's no there's no getting away away from that and um not that you'd want to but i i do think it's all important to understand that i mean when you, uh, I know you don't debate because you're looking for opportunities to speak to people and to and to show them what you've learned in your life. But how do you deal with things like the virgin birth? Because you know, I mean, the 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 way in which Jewish people would understand it is completely different from you and 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 I. 
they, they have a very different interpretation. Before we get into the specifics of that, um, how important is interpretation and how much do you incor incorporate Jewish, Jewish um, uh, understanding into your beliefs? It's a lot of questions there, Christian. <laughs> I know, Gosh, you're a smart guy. I don't know. <laughs> um, I think there is, there is, when I speak to Orthodox Jewish friends in particular and listen to their understanding of who God is, and the way that they perceive him in many ways they're, they're really right they do understand god's character mm. um the lens of Ju rabbinic judaism um is um believe that really comes from the talmud <clears throat> mm. um can be significantly different really is going to be significant for the bible their method of interpreting the bible looking at the bible um is just different and i think the only way to to begin to appreciate it is to listen to your Jewish friends and to explore that, find particular stories, um, and uh, and just a marvel. I mean, if nothing else, I think it creates for great theology. I remember one speaking to one Jewish student some years ago, and he was trying to explain to me why Cain and Cain and Abel, Cain and Abel were so different to Adam and Eve's children. Why are they so different? You know, both of them are devoted to God, both bring offerings, one's accepted, one's not. And he said, well, it's because if you understand a little bit about the Hebrew, mm. you'll kind of understand that one was born in the Garden of Eden and mm. one was born outside of the Garden of Eden. <clears throat> and I'm thinking to myself, I have never had that thought before. Right. So that's great theology, great to think it through. And of course, that's... Um, I think one of the things that's uh, part of a Jewish worldview is creativity and imagination, which no wonder there's so much great theology there in the Talmud. Um, if you've got an imagination like that to think it through. Mm. Um, and also you'd have to follow it through to its conclusion to find out, is it, is it true? Um, does it make a difference to our understanding of the nature of sin, mm. the nature of uh, the, uh, the two guys? That the nature of theology isn't about whether you're right or wrong, whether you're representing God or you're not, mm. but rather it's just the, the sheer thrill of thinking through things, which most people have never. For example, even the idea, why was why do we believe that, that Satan took on the persona of a snake? Mm. Admittedly, before the fall, the snake would have legs. Um, a talking snake with legs is pretty weird. Why, why, do, why do that? Why didn't mm. he become as a cat or a dog or a bat? And again, that would again be interesting theology. And I'm sure the Talmud has many ideas or even in Jewish thought, you know, Adam is introduced to all of the animals in the garden of Eden and rightly so, because God is showing or having a conversation with Adam and saying, um, do you think you can have a relationship with any one of these animals? Mm. And the Talmud has some very interesting ideas about his relationships with these animals. But until eventually uh, he, he's introduced to a woman, someone who is opposite to him, someone who's like him, someone who's going to be a helper, someone who's very different to all of the animals. And even in sheer that, that kind of contrast is already getting us thinking about the sheer significance of women in the Bible mm. and about, their, about how much a man needs a woman. <clears throat> Very, very yeah, true. I'm sure you can test it by. Yeah, I often think about interpretation and use that word lens many times, but I think there are sort of, there are these um, pivotal moments in the Bible that sort of we, um, you know, as Christians, we have sort of limited understanding of. And I think one of, one of the things that I'd like to unpack with you, if that's okay, um, is a little bit more about the virgin birth and if i look at the uh, the passage that we we read in isaiah isaiah 7 14 it reads as follows behold the alma shall conceive and shall bear a son and shall call his name emmanuel i guess there are are um when i've had when i've had discussion with people there are kind of two issues here um and i think for the sake of convenience we should probably deal with them separately um can that son, number one, be Jesus? And, and number two, does Alma, does it actually mean virgin? And these are the two things sort of in, in the light of it all that, that sort of, you know, you can go back and forth on these things. But from, from, from your perspective, 
what would you say about that? Can, could this be the sun? Is that what, what Isaiah is referring to here? And does he mean that the sun shall be born of a virgin? Arguments about words, I think, are, are unhelpful. So I won't engage in arguments about words. What's going to be far more exciting is about context. Yes. And the, uh, what we see, I think, in a, an initial first reading of Isaiah mm. is uh, Israel's in crisis. And, uh, and yet, as we drift from Isaiah to Isaiah 7 to 11, we're seeing God is making promises. Mm. You know, God knows the future. God is going to use... Um, Assyria to, to, to destroy um, Israel. They're going to be a weapon. Israel's going to be an, an instrument in God's hands. Um, nothing is beyond God. All things are, God is completely sovereign. And yet Assyria, because of their wickedness against Israel, will still be punished by God. I mean, right. Assyria is still fulfilling their desire to be wicked. And God is saying, well, they're wicked and I will use their wickedness against Israel to punish Israel. And so Jewish people think today, in, in, in religious Jewish people understand even when it comes to something like the Holocaust, um, religious Jewish thought believes that we were guilty of sinning against God, maybe because we didn't stop a secular Jewish people by eating or by buying, opening shop on the Sabbath. So that's why they're being punished, but we're the religious Jews and we're being punished because we didn't do enough to stop it. So it's a tremendous picture of absolute sovereignty of God. <clears throat> but I think what you see in Isaiah is Israel especially with the particular king that they had at the time, very weak king, frightened king, willing to compromise politically in every single way possible. And, uh, and actually this is getting to, a, I suppose, to a point in Israel's history when you might see that the line of Judah, the line of kings, destroyed. Mm. And I think what we're seeing here is God is saying, now, hang on a minute, I've got promise, God is literally saying, I've got promises to fulfill through the Davidic line, so let's just let's just hold off and and look. I am going to provide. You don't need to to fear. Right. So the moment of great great danger upon this Davidic line, God steps in and says, "Look, I'll make a promise to you." And it's a bit strange, isn't it, that God is making this particular promise to Ahab in uh, seven fourteen? What does he say? The Lord will give you a sign. Well, the Lord of this is it's almost out of context it almost has nothing to, what we the only thing we know by the idea of a child being born if you read from uh, chapter 7 to 11 is that you know that God is with you in judgment when a child comes that's all we can really say from the story what you do get when you hit to uh, Isaiah 9 you get the astonishing story of this of a child being born who's given this unimaginably glorious name, the wonderful counselor, mighty God, you know, everlasting father. And we think, I'm so sorry, even, even the Jewish publication society is going to have to put brackets around this, to, but, but still can't deal with the fact, why do you give such an elevated name to a child? And when you get to Isaiah 11, you're, we always think of a king in Israel being majestic, being a leader, godly. But when you get to Isaiah 11, you're looking at a king that transcends every reality. It, this king is otherworldly. Uh, he is portrayed as uh, the greatest and almost the, the divine king. So whatever, so it's almost like shadows and types of kings were introduced. But by the time you get to Isaiah, it's a bit like someone is opening the shutters and the blinding light is coming into the room. We're thinking, I thought I knew what what it looked what it looks like to be a king a bit, but now I've been overwhelmed, flooded. Right. And I think I think Isaiah is still veiled. Mm. I think even Isaiah said, whatever I'm writing needs to be stored away as testimony against you in the future. Yeah. No one understands this. But in the days of Jesus, Matthew then includes in his gospel, in a, in a rabbinic style of literature that's unusual for us. He's basically saying that was talking about Jesus. And it's not that he's taking anything out of context. But he's basically saying in the, in the formula, which I think echoes throughout all of scripture, a child is going to be born, <clears throat> whether it was to Abraham or Sarah, the miracle child in their old age, or whether it's the story of Hannah, mm. and one Samuel, and a child is born. Right. What you're looking at here is uh, against remarkable odds. God is going to, a child is going to be born. And you know that, you know, when a child is born, you know, the judgment's coming. 
Because if anything, if Isaiah says anything, the birth of a child means judgment. God is with you, mm. Emmanuel, but not in the way that you would like or hope, but in judgment. Mm. And ultimately, uh, Jesus is really bringing it in judgment. There will be old judgment on the ultimate, on the ultimate final day. But but the offer is available on the table now. Right. Because of his death and resurrection, he's saying you have an opportunity to be forgiven. Judgment is coming. It is inevitable in the real sense of heaven and hell judgments coming. And uh, so we see this gives you a bit of a picture, I think, what Isaiah is doing without going into any more detail. Mm. Um, Matthew, so do you, very good, very good. But, but going back to this idea of a virgin birth, do you, do you believe in a literal virgin birth? I tell you of all of the impossible things that, that, that the New Testament expects us to believe, um, Jesus being the son of God, being eternal, uncreated, or him dying for our sins and rising, I think the last thing I came to believe, and I remember thinking to myself as I was believing, I was, I was, I, it was the last thing, it was the thing I struggled with the longest mm. until eventually I said, well, I've come to believe everything about Jesus. I believe that his, his death genuinely can provide forgiveness for people who come to Jesus. I believe that Jesus, because by virtue of his work, um, he speaks of his identity for him to be the savior of the world he has to be um without sin to be the sacrifice he has to be able to impart righteousness this must be god who's taken on human form mm. um and then at that point i think once you've come to believe clearly and solidly within the within the story of jesus who he is mm. his claims then eventually it, it becomes quite natural to think actually yeah, of course, of course, I believe in the virgin birth, because the integrity of the New Testament writers begins, goes from beginning to end. It's not like they suddenly became more sincere at page three. They were sincere on page one. If anything, what is astonishing, the very first book of the New Testament is Matthew's gospel. Mm. And he tells us from the very beginning, we haven't even left chapter one. Mm. And he's telling us that Joseph is not, not Jesus's father. And I'm thinking to myself, this is probably the most awkward and embarrassing thing can you imagine um, imagine it's a bit like you know i mean sometimes i heard this one guy probably went to a therapist and his therapist said because he was a big guy and he used to sweat profusely i mean all of the time and he spoke to his therapist and he said um i, I need help because i'm so self-conscious of my sweating i don't know what to do and the therapist says whenever you meet anybody the first thing you must say to them is i sweat profusely you must get it out of the way immediately. And he began to tell everyone that he sweats profusely. And, it, and then it really began to transform him. And he, be, and he began to sweat a lot less. That right? Yes, indeed. Because he, he's not self-conscious about it anymore. Yeah, yeah. And at the beginning of the gospel, Matthew's simply saying, up front, <clears throat> this is the reality of who Jesus is. I think John does it in a very similar way. In John's gospel, it's the word became flesh. The eternal uncreated God took on flesh. He added it to him like you'd wear a garment that would fit beautifully to you, onto you. Um, and, it, and this, as it were, these clothes are perfectly shaped around the character and person of Jesus, the son of God, who's eternal, who came into this world. That story is just told differently in Matthew's gospel. He's speaking very much as someone who is there to help us truly understand the fullness of the Hebrew Bible. If you know, it's one thing for all of the gospel writers, they don't appeal to Greek wisdom. They only ever appeal to Hebraic scriptures. Sure. They go to the Hebrew Bible and they make their point. And um, when we begin to see so many of those prophecies fitting into Jesus's life, and, you, and then you go look at the beginning and you think he has started with the strangest thing isaiah 7 i mean but it, with the remarkable claim doesn't it in matthew 1 21 he starts so early on when he says where does it say matthew 1 21 yeah uh, she will bear a son which is very much the formula of all of the children special children born in the bible whether it's isaac whether it's um uh, samuel born to hannah or even whether it was um, Ish Ishmael, uh, the, the son of uh, Abraham's uh, kind of uh, servant girl. Mm -hmm. 
but his she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins right. it's just very similar to the beginning of John's gospel mm -hmm. behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world these are beautifully crafted pieces of literature that speak theologically into the reality of who Jesus is because they're looking for us to have a very clear understanding so it's not like somehow the, the revelation of Jesus gets stronger through a gospel now it's it's in, it's absolutely from from the go get it is about him we can have no should have no doubt about who he is and what has come and that it is rooted in the Hebrew scriptures so you said that you know it was one of the hardest things for you to overcome to believe in in the virgin birth. Um, what would you say to Jewish people now who are sort of struggling with this? What's what? How did you overcome it? What was the what was the smoking gun for you? Without repeating myself, I think it is looking at Jesus. Is he telling us the truth? Mm. I mean, when you when you read a gospel, you're immediately going to be presented with the person of Jesus um he's the one we have to wrestle with he's the one we are, we are to have to submit before and as we come to understand him then everything surrounding him makes sense well if you understand him then you think okay now he's qualified to be the savior and you think theologically his agenda it actually completely fits the entire narrative of the bible and then you look at his life and you see so many of the hundreds of prophecies about his life are coming true in him and then you come to those more obscure things like Isaiah 7 and this uh, virgin birth. And you look at all of Isaiah chapter 7 to 11, or then you begin to look at all of, I don't know, how many chapters in Isaiah? I think 61, 65, 65. You begin to understand, actually, that what is Isaiah talking about? It's a book of two, two cities, an earthly Jerusalem, which is sinful, finishing in a heavenly Jerusalem that is exalted mm. you store you see as you go through Isaiah you see a story of Israel that is sinful that is disobedient even a donkey knows its master but Israel does not know his master and then you get towards the end and you're, you're seeing a transformation in all of Israel there, there are many servants and of course and then you wrestle with Isaiah and you come to a clear idea it's the whole picture is that one day there would be a servant who would deal with the problem so when you're looking at Matthew's gospel, it's almost like you see, it's almost like the film script is written in the in uh, the Hebrew scriptures, mm. but the movie is made in the gospels. And all they're doing is they're thinking they're just taking the script, and it's it literally it's fleshed out by the person of Jesus. Mm. And so actually, it's wonderful to to think Jesus didn't come into the world as a, as a just as a baby presented into the arms of Mary. But rather, she became, as it were, the surrogate, surrogate who would actually uh, bear the child. Mm. To think that Jesus at one point was as small in Mary's womb, as small as a peanut, mm. and uh, you know, and eventually became the size of a, of a melon. But but born her her child, and uh, and just to think about God's character, why has God done, God done this? You think of Adam was created out of dust. Mm. we're talking about a, and there are places like in jeremiah it's jeremiah 31 that speaks about god doing something new yes speaks about in a language that actually resembles the virgin birth remarkably and actually we're seeing actually god is doing something new he's going to he's going to bring a man into the world that's going to be completely different to adam he's not going to do it in a similar way he's not going to be another sinful man who's going to make mistakes this is going to be and as they say if you want to do a job properly do it yourself so i think what we see here is god taking on the role this is his image he fits naturally into it he can take on flesh and however we think about the image of god as, as in its ultimate sense is the uh, is to rule and superintend over all of nature and so the the, the creator himself takes on the, that god-given image this role of ruler and, uh, and now we see him in his world manifestly doing the one thing that we need, which is to really reverse the, the fall, reverse the curse of sin. I don't know how I've, I've done with your question, but, but, but you see, you start off with looking at Jesus and then you begin to understand the virgin birth. So when it comes to Jesus, you may have many objections. You may think of evolution. You might think of, I don't know, uh, what other thing is evolution might be one thing people struggle with 
you might be struggling with um, uh, all kinds of anti-Semitism against that's, that's been caused in the name of Jesus. Mm. And also there's the virgin birth is one of the issues there. But it's like, it's, instead of looking at evolution up front, what we need to do is think of this as a house. And whenever you want to enter a house, we don't typically enter through the chimney or through the windows. We don't, the, the window cleaner's not trying to break in through the upper windows, we hope. What we do is we have a front door and that front door is Jesus. We go into this room, go into the front room, the hallway, and we explore who Jesus is. And once we're in the house, then we can begin to realize, oh, there are all these other rooms. And maybe we'll say, there's a room at the back. Well, that's the evolution room. Now you understand who Jesus is. Now you can go and have a look at that room and just begin to understand a little bit about evolution and death and suffering. You probably want to go into the other room, which is the virgin birth room. Yeah. And then we'll explore why God came into the world this way, why it's possible, why it had to happen this way. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, we come to Jesus first and then we begin to answer. And the question is, if we're sincerely interested in Jesus, then that's the way. Let's look at him. Um, I think if you're if you're if you're stumbling over virgin birth to start with, mm. you probably just have to work out: is it because someone has keep, kept going on about the virgin birth being the reason? Is your motivation to talk about the virgin birth because you want to other people not to believe it? You want to disrupt their their faith? Why the motive? It's always a question of motivation. Mm. Think about yourself. Um, the virgin birth is no doubt. If you look at it up front with no context to jesus i think the virgin birth is going to sound possibly pagan possibly greek and mysterious and it will sound like it has nothing to do with the hebrew bible but i think as we come to the person of jesus <clears throat> i think we then have the, the possibility of saying um, <clears throat> this makes sense this is actually very much part of the story the jewish story mm -hmm, indeed and I, I get that. I, I get that. I think I think there's a lot of, you know, we, we talked about interpretation when you look at the word and, and, and you know, the, the Jews obviously have a very different interpretation of some of the scriptures, scriptures that we do, in particular, the term Messiah. And um, and, I, and I think certainly from my perspective and I'm sort of limited, I don't have the experience that you have. But I think it's a big struggle for Jewish people to think and to accept that jesus who is a man is god and i think this concept of, of of there being you know jesus the man is jesus is god it's a big chasm it's a big jump and understandably so because um uh, it's very clear in the old testament that god is not a man how would you approach that and what how do you get your head around that it's a, it's a very big deal I think, I think the first thing is to recognize that the God has not become man, but rather God, I'm sorry, it's not that man has become yeah. God. I'm glad you, you were listening. This is really, <laughs> really good to say it the wrong way around. But rather to think God, the creator, the eternal spirit being, mm. the, 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 the causer, the uncaused causer, the one who causes all things, the one who is in whom is all life. Um, that, he creates an entire universe out of nothing right he speaks life into being on earth and so that doesn't preclude the possibility that god could take on human form we see many um, shadows of people who are whether angelic or people angelic beings with the name of the lord in right right we're seeing uh, visible manifestations all the manifestations of god in the bible have to be physical manifestations the mountain was on fire at mount sinai three men come to see abraham and one of them is clearly identified as as god so it's the understanding that actually uh we see a man created in god's image in the garden of eden to superintend over all, all of the creation. We're looking at, as we go through the entire Bible storyline, you get to the person of Jesus and we look at him and we're mystified by him. Mm. The people who hear him are either delighted that he has healed them, given them sight or restored their, their, their disability. 
And then many people are just absolutely horrified by Jesus because he's speaking in the most blasphemous way, because he speaks as if God is his own father, as if he is the only son. Mm. But at least I think we can now look back on all of the Bible and begin to say, well, we were expecting a king. If you look at Isaiah 11, we were looking at a, a king who does things beyond our imagination. We are looking at the restoration of all of humanity for their sin to be genuinely dealt with. If Yom Kippur is dealing with sin on an annual basis for all of our intentional sins, why is it going on every single year? So there are many little signs throughout the Bible that God has put lots of systems in place which are temporary. Mm. But would God ever deal? So you get to somewhere like Isaiah 53, you're dealing with sin. It sounds like a man is even dying for the sins of the world. It's all of the materials down there. So when we get to the person of Jesus, a man claiming to be God, it's not like with 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 what is, what is it's not like we're straining and stretching in our imagination to think how can this possibly work out? Rather, we're thinking. It's like you might buy a Lego set for a child with 35 Lego bricks and they can follow the instructions and they can pull all the bricks together and they make a little fire station. That's what it's like. We look at Jesus and we think we, we're given all of this, all of the necessary Hebrew um, uh, citations from the Hebrew Bible and we can put it together and we can think, right, this actually makes complete sense that God would take on human form. And it's, it is the only solution. To deal with the seriousness of sin, we do need a savior who is really qualified to deal with the actual problem. If there's one thing we know is that sin leads to death, sin makes us, deforms our character and our nature, our desires are war. Yeah. And yet, how is God? We look at, you know, whether it's the temple or the tabernacle, many of these things were put into place to, to sustain a really awkward relationship between a man and God. If you dumb down on sin and belittle sin and think sin is just making a little mistake, mm. or you think I never mistake, made a mistake, no, never sinned, or my grandmother never sinned, then of course you don't need a savior anymore. Mm. When you understand the true nature of the, of the horrific nature of sin and what it's done to mankind, and look at the especially in the kind of work that you do and the, the de depravity of mankind in the way that people are abducted, especially mm. younger people. I think we understand that there is desperate sickness in the world. And even if you're a very morally upstanding human being, yeah. you look inside yourself, you know, you've made choices and decisions often at other people's expense. You've spoken about people that's not, you've had thoughts of the heart that should, we should be ashamed of if anyone knew about. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up the, the, the issue of sin, because I think um, I do recall having a conversation <clears> with a Jewish friend and he said, oh, that's just damnation theology. You know, you're using Jesus to um, to bring us to, to your religion. And um, I remember thinking about that and thinking, you know, it's, well, yeah, I, was, I guess there is an element of, of, of damnation in, in, in understanding that we are sinful human beings. What, what do you think about it? How would you, I mean, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because we live in a day and age now where sort of sin is kind of like, well, that's a very old fashioned word and oh, come on, really? Are you re do we really need forgiveness of sin? Why do I need forgiveness of sins? You know, what, what would you say about the, the damnation theology and the forgiveness of, of sins and, and the importance of it? Because I think it's pivotal, isn't it? The, the whole point of Jesus is forgiveness of sins. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Absolutely. That's it. It's about us being forgiven by God. Mm. And I think none of us think we need to be forgiven. I mean, if you've had an argument with your wife, if you have upset your son or your daughter, you do know what forgiveness is. I and mean, these are not yeah. abstract ideas. I don't have, right. to, don't have to be on a particular five week course where we have to explain to you, you, you know this yeah it's about a broken relationship you want to restore it you 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 sometimes you do these things on purpose we're a bit spiteful we're selfish marriage of course is the place when you come to realize that it's death of self you, you can't live for yourself you can't live as a single person in a marriage sure maybe for a week until she kicks you out of the house but you <laughs> but, um, um we're actually supposed to be absolutely dependent upon God, but we're independent beings. That's how we live, naturally independent. We feel truly entitled to everything that we feel we need. Well, this just describes our character. The Bible says actually that this is this is this is um this is an it's an ugly, rebellious attitude. Mm -hmm.
are that even when we know the boundaries, we have boundaries, everyone has to set boundaries of other human beings. Yes. Because we, we often get upset by other boundaries. And uh, we actually see in the Bible, God sets boundaries. He gives them the Ten Commandments. He gives them many commandments. He tells them even not to come too close to the tabernacle, literally setting boundaries, because he actually, under, he's basically saying, look, we, we have to have a relationship. And I know it's, it's and it's also kind of a really um, difficult relationship, a strained relationship. Um, the golden calf, I mean, it's a picture of idolatry. You know, if your husband or wife is unfaithful to you, you have a choice whether to take them back. This is um, this is reality for for many people's marriages. Yeah. Um, and actually, I think so. We we know what forgiveness is. So the Bible speaks about God loving His bride, who He raised since a child, and um, or often the picture is often as a father raised a son, but the son and the, or the bride has has gone astray. Mm. Book of Hosea it speaks about how he's supposed to the prophet is supposed to marry a prophet uh, a prostitute, yeah. Um, because ultimately that really speaks of God's love for Israel. Yes. And um, if you are willing to forgive your adulterous wife, then you are getting closer to understanding God's love for humanity. Yeah. But God's love is not cheap. Or it is not easy, but demands that God do do something utterly radical. So He has to become the second adam he has to come into this world and he will he will live a perfect life he will experience every temptation we have because we live in the flesh too and then he will suffer and die as a sacrifice just in exactly the same language of of the sacrifices which were done in the temple which speak because then everyone knows what a sacrifice is it's there to deal with our sin that is what jesus is doing mm, indeed indeed do you call yourself a christian I mean, I'm not called Christian. That's you. But, <laughs> but would you would you refer to yourself as a Christian? I mean, I, I, I is a leading question, but but I'm unavoidably Christian because I believe that Jesus is God's son and that He forgives me. Right. Do I call myself that? No, I don't call myself that. I just call myself a Jewish believer in Jesus, primarily because the word Christian is <clears throat> um, misunderstood. I think Hugely, yeah. people will use the word Christian for a host of reasons mm. and they were brought up that way they live in an english british they live in england they're brought up in a christian country um but if you were to ask them if they believe jesus is god's son they would say of course not mm. well that means you're not a christian and then they'll think you're being a bit judgmental <laughs> well, <laughs> the reality is um <clears throat> being christian is not a political word not a nationalistic word it's a word that <clears throat> identifies you with Jesus. He's yeah. called the Christ. He's called the, the anointed one, yeah. the Messiah. And if you identify with him, you are a Christian. It's just that in Jewish circles, the word Christian has negative connotations mm. and, uh, and can see, be perceived that really badly. Yeah. Um, when we often, if, if you are a Christian and if you love the Lord Jesus, you think of the word Christian, that word is a lovely word. Mm. it's a tender word a sweet word but for many of your jewish friends they think it's a vicious word a manipulative word a nasty word because obviously the many crimes have been committed in the name of jesus against jewish people yeah and the reality is it's it's inexcusable but yeah. the reality is um for much of christian europe in its long history mm. to be a christian was a po political idea far more than a a devout belief that uh, Jesus is God's son. So people have subverted and abused the name of Jesus. Mm. They've commandeered it for it, this, their own political agenda. Mm. And it has nothing to do with, with Jesus. Okay. And interesting because as we are made in God's image, which would mean we are supposed to be God's ambassadors. We're supposed to reflect him. We're like, you know, we represent as it were, ambassador of, reflects the queen in a foreign country. But as human beings, no one, no one truly honors the, the king the one who sent us we don't really look like him at all anymore because sin has shattered our natures mm. we're just very suffering oriented we're independent we're awol <laughs> and, uh, we are we're not representing at all agreed and i think you know i i think you've got a tough job honestly if you're reaching out to jewish <laughs> people it's a very tough job because if you think about it we're so divided as christians or whatever you want to call yourself um 
there must be approximately two to 3,000 different kinds of Jesus because we don't agree on anything. We don't agree on the resurrection. We don't agree on <clears> the Holy <throat> Spirit, the Trinity. And so you've got Mormons, Pentecostals, Baptists, etc., that just all believe different things. And, you know, I, I, I don't blame a Jewish person for saying, guys, you can't even, you can't even work it out amongst yourselves. Sure. How do you deal with that? And, and, and that's question number one. That's sort of part one. But part B of that is look at all of the idolatry in Christianity. You know, I, I visited um, um, Rome um, at the beginning of this year. And, you know, I was walking around St. Peter's and I was like, my goodness, this place is just full of idolatry. Sorry to my Catholic friends, but it was like unbelievable. It was just so in your face. Yeah. And so I, you, you can't really blame Jewish people for not, not for the, the amount of things they have to sort of accept to be able to accept Jesus seems to be insurmountable. What do you do with that? There's nothing we can do other than speak faithfully, live for Jesus. I mean, that's fundamentally what we do. Be known as a believer amongst your friends, family, work colleagues. Um, and as we're transformed by God's character, by the, the work of the Spirit, as we engage with God's words, the Bible, we'll be different and people will, people will see that. Mm. Um, it's not that we have to be suddenly extreme extroverts, but we do need to be so different maybe that's something to really think about what does it look like to look to be as a follower of jesus to look distinct and and have a good reason to explain why you do believe in jesus but we can't change people we can't even change ourselves mm. but god is willing to change everyone and we are left with the mystery of why god has done it this way through human weakness he gets one human being who believes in jesus to in through his frailty and his humble life to somehow speak of Jesus. But I think if your if you're Messiah, your Jewish Messiah, Jesus is crucified, is uh, crucified, naked, blooded, and murdered in this horrific way, um, it's the ultimate picture of weakness and humiliation, then I, then I think we shouldn't at all be surprised when we find Christian people are asked to live humble, simple lives, even ones which are, where, where people even lose their lives when persecu certainly persecuted and maligned, um, it makes sense. It means because ultimately God wants you to be like him and will actually trans transform you to the image of his son, the Lord Jesus. Um, so we can't try and change anyone um, at all. If you think you can genuinely change other people, then you can, you can just spend a couple of hours just enjoying what God has said Okay. The Bible and find out this is the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't yeah. do it. Yeah, I agree. But so, so give us an give us some examples. So you're 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 talking about <clears throat> your faith in Jesus. Faith in Jesus is obviously very real to you. You don't have any doubts, um, and you get taken down these rabbit holes. Well, look at all of your idols. And look, you know, look at these different Jesuses that you've got that you all claim is the Son of God, and you not, none of you agree. I mean, how do you how do you navigate that? Do you just do you just do you, do, you, do you address things head on or do you just push them? No, but, but, the but you have tapped into one of my favorite topics um, because ultimately, like we're meeting each other now. We've, we understand each other to the degree that we can communicate in this very, very free way. And ultimately, whenever you're meeting your Jewish friend or meeting any friend who you, is a friend of yours and you want to share the gospel with them, it's going to be natural, absolutely yeah. natural. It's you. Um, um, it's your heartfelt desire, but you're not shouting at them. You're not preaching at them. Even if they accuse you of preaching at them when you've barely said anything at all. Right. You're just, you're trying to find out how fast they're traveling. Mm. Um, you want to kind of get an idea of what they're interested in. Yeah. Who they are as people and speak the gospel into their lives. I mean, um, there was uh, the, uh, the Olympics, there was a bit of a baton foul up crisis in the american team if i remember just about do i remember it rightly i'm not sure what you mean i think that the i think the american team got it all wrong with the baton passing oh i see yes the baton passing yeah. you're not traveling at the right speed and your hands and arms are not in the right place yeah can't communicate so we're really talking about communication so if you want to communicate the gospel to your friends you've got to meet them you've got to be in phase with them 
there's no point being out of step and thinking they're going to understand because ultimately we, the, 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 the mantra of communication is communication is an event that happens in the other person's mind. It doesn't matter what you say. The qu question is, what have they received? Mm. You know, you may be speaking, but is there any evidence they've understood it? Yeah. And again, you can be checking. And above all, we're looking for uh, sincerity, motivation. Why? And not being naive. naive. Why do people want to speak to you? Mm. Why do you want to speak to other people? Um, to really meet each other and ultimately a place of love and trust. When we might say that when your Jewish friend or any friend for this matter, uh, they trust you as the Christian, then, then you're in a great place. That's the great beginning. Because ultimately, by being known as someone that they feel um, is worthy, that knows, that loves them, trusts, that is uh, trustworthy, they're already seeing someone who's fantastically different. And actually, if you are the only Christian in your community, there may be you are standing out already by living a, a life of dependence upon the Lord, trusting in him, loving him. And therefore, you don't have the anxieties that the world does. And you're set. You're, you're, you're good to go. People will look at you in your friendships that you have and think that you're different. I think going back to the issue you briefly mentioned, this issue of doubt. Whenever we do doubt, just look at Jesus, because we are not going to find confidence that Jesus is telling you the truth by looking inside yourself. Right. Yeah. You only gain confidence by trusting. You trusted Jesus in the first place by looking at him, yeah. looking at his works, his actions, looking at the things that he does and says. And, and so we, we are people who people will be drawn to us because we're transformed by Jesus. But we now point people to, to Jesus. And so the, the best thing we can do <clears throat> is to be really fresh and open and ready and say, look, I'd love to open the pages of one of the, the eyewitness accounts of life, death and resurrection of Jesus so that you can experience the Jesus that I've come to discover. Mm -hmm. we, we should be unashamed and rejoice. Uh, that we are being included in God's purposes and plans and to know that you could see God's work before your very eyes as people are bear, as, as you bear fruit, as the spirit works. Yeah, I mean, it certainly, I mean, it certainly is... Uh something that we should be meditating on is like how we live our lives how people see how they see through our shop window so to speak and to see the work of jesus and loving each other and those uh, they'll be known for their love for one another and these kind of things i think a lot of those things get lost on us you know we get into the busyness of life and um that's lost tell us a bit about um your heart for jewish people what you want to see you know what does the jewish future look like um or, you know, what, what are your desires uh, for, for the rest of your life? What do you want to see happen in your lifetime? I spoke about that, that baton illustration. And I suppose in many ways, um, I want to be able to, to raise up a, a collection of Jewish people who love the Lord Jesus, who would go on in many ways and replace, replace me when I become old and pass away. Um, so that in the generations to come, Jewish people have a, an ongoing opportunity to know that uh, God loves them, that God sent his son into the world, and for there to be a genuine Jewish witness. Mm. People can look at the church, and it can look very Gentile, it can look very English. Yeah. And but for Jewish people, well, they love being Jewish. And we're simply saying you don't stop being Jewish when you believe in Jesus. We want to say, actually you find uh, the fullest, richest manifestation of your Jewish identity in knowing the person of Jesus. And so day to day, it's just a thrill knowing I'm included in God's work. I have an opportunity to speak to Jewish people, a tremendous amount, whether they be very secular or very religious. And um, I am just one, whatever I impart to them is nothing more than a drop in a bucket. I may say one thing. I, may, I know a Muslim friend years ago <clears throat> and a, a Christian work colleague said to him that Jesus loves his enemies. And that single thought percolated in that, that Muslim's mind for 10 years until it, it began to register and he began a journey to discover who Jesus is. 10 years. And then he went on to, to, uh, to become a believer. And now amongst many Muslim people, he is he's sharing his faith. Yes. under difficult difficult conditions and so every time 
when you've really met someone and you've you've really got to a point when you know they're listening and you know they've understood mm. and that's the moment when a drop has entered their bucket it hasn't missed it's gone into the bucket it's gone into their soul yes. and this is this is something that i feel that the holy spirit can work with yeah that's awesome and awesome and from lastly um from the from a perspective of scripture what does it say about the jewish people what does it say about what's going to happen perhaps um you know not talking about end times necessarily but what, what does the future look like for jewish people according to your perspective i think i don't have a perspective other than the, the bible's perspective i mean romans is the book that probably lays out the clearest it's the clearest revelation that there is a, a partial hardening upon this round romans mm. 11 but there will be there will be revival there will be a day when jewish people will come to know the lord in abundance uh, we don't live in that time now. People are Jewish people are coming to know the Lord every day. It's more of a, a trickle than a than a, a, a than a gush than a right. than a dam being breached. But I do I do I think the Bible is clear that, that there is um, God still has His eye on Israel. God still loves them. And throughout, when you look at throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, you see that God Israel isn't some kind of like project some kind of miniature of what God is going to do later on in the church. Now, this is a genuine relationship. God genuinely loves Israel and he will bring them to knowledge of him. But as it says in Romans, uh, Romans 9, not all of Israel is Israel. We are looking at the fact there will always be a remnant to choose the language of Isaiah. Um, God will knows who his own are and he will choose them, both from uh, the Jewish people, Israel, and from all of the nations. And... Um, God has a plan for Israel and it, it continues, it will continue to the end. God knows his own, he chose them and he'll bring them in. Mm, that's excellent. So, so well, just a little bit more on that. So <laughs> are, we, uh, are we in the um, messianic age or not? Is that to come or what, what's I'm the I'm not sure what the messianic age is, but what we do know is we're living in the, in the era of the spirit. This mm. is, uh, Jesus has done the work. Forgiveness of sins is now available. And by the work of the spirit, people can come to Jesus as people it's the work of the spirit really amazing I mean, people can't come to Jesus unless the spirit is working in their life um but we are this is the last age and a day will come when Jesus says very clearly in John's gospel and many gospels um he is going to come back Jesus will come back and the day of judgment will begin it's what we said from Isaiah 7 to 11 um you know uh, when God is with you you know judgment is coming sure. and imagine just think about it if God decided to condescend to take on human form to come into this world. And I said, I'm going to introduce you to God. Your natural response would be to say, to get onto your hands and knees and say, depart from me, Lord, I'm a miserable sinner. Would be the right response. And I, I think actually, uh, I think that's how I think that's how the disciples kind of they understood it. They understood it. Um, and I think we. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, a window of not a window of opportunity. It means repentance is available for every human being. Mm. Um, we may not understand why God has done it this way, but this is the way it is. Yes. Um, Jesus is one of the most famous people who ever lived who claimed to be God's son. Mm. It sounds insane, but I think as we've come to discover who Jesus is in these eyewitness accounts, and you look at the Hebrew Bible backing it all up, I think it's uh, undeniable. And now is an opportunity to, to submit to him. Fascinating stuff. Thank you, Ziggy. It's been uh, a pleasure as always. Until next time. Until next time.